it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah downtime. So if eight, a little after eight here. Mm-hmm. Are you in the East Coast or on the East Coast or California? Uh, or not you? quite. I'm, I'm actually in Columbus, Ohio. Ohio, um, that's right. So I'm on right. the towards the western edge of the eastern time zone. We have some okay. terrific friends in Columbus, uh, the Miller brothers, who uh, are 35-year-old twins who came to our confluence. Hmm. And uh, they were just great at our confluence and were great participants <clears throat> and seemed to very much enjoy uh, what, the, what was happening uh, out there. And they got some huge connections. Um, one of the Miller brothers is a welder and he got, he had Tim invite him to come and spend some time with Tim um, as, because Tim is a, is a metal worker primarily, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's how he, Tim developed his art as a metal worker. And so he, Tim urged him to come out and do a work of art with Tim and uh, so on. And uh, the other brother is a, is a trucker and uh, he has a trucking company. And uh, there was a very interesting individual there in Helena that he met who's a great connection. And so this is what happens when you come to an event like this, you meet Uh people and opportunities that you had no clue you could meet and participate in. If you you came, you you have to come on faith. And Uh of course course we, um, we published all of our public, all of our public events uh on youtube or not all of them yet i have a bunch of video yet that i haven't put up yet but um but the the power of the confluence is physically being there (laughs) and it's just so powerful you can't even imagine it um and um and so it looks like we're going to do it again in the fall of 23 at a, a retreat center called Mount Madonna uh, down in central California. It's, it's apparently right above Santa Cruz um, and it's uh, Mount Madonna retreat center. Um, and it's interesting, that kind of conflict. I mean, yeah. because that's, that's actually how I got my, my book deal is I self-published in 2008, and then I show up at Reader Studio, Tara Reader Studio in New York City, which is like 220 some people from all over the world for yeah. three, four days. Right. Where you don't you don't leave the hotel, and I, I walked into the lobby, and immediately was in this conversation with 10 people who I'd never met in person, and um, it's like Mary Greer, Rachel Pollock, you know, Bob Place, and oh, and wow. then. Yeah, out of nowhere, you know, there's like this whole tape brown group. They all went silent and they all looked at me and as if they knew something I didn't. And all of a sudden I hear Mr. Hoggard, you know, yelled over the lobby. And I'm kind of thinking, I've never been to New York. Um, and now I'm in a hotel lobby and someone's calling out my name. And I had this big tug on my elbow. And she said, Mr. Hoggard, are you are you fond of, of not answering to your name and I said something about my mom strangers do you have any candy (laughs) and and she said come here I want to introduce you to somebody and it was Pete Schiffer who's the the president of Schiffer Publications and he said we heard about your tarot voice idea literally making the cards speak in the first person here and he shoves a contract in my face and he said, will you write a 200 page book to go with the deck? And I mean, poof, I'd been there, you know, 18 minutes. You know? <laughs> and I said, yeah. well, I certainly will. So yeah. well, <laughs> but, that, I mean, that, you wouldn't get that any, any other place. Yeah. That's how it works. Um, that's assuredly how it works. And so we're t- in our confluence. We're taking a little different approach but um 
interestingly, in the in this book, uh, reflections of, pa- of a passerby, they literally, she literally talks about um, in a couple of pages what they were doing back in the day and uh, what we were doing um, in confluence. So uh, it's very, very interesting. You actually using the same words that we were using. Uh, I need to say something to my wife to hold on a sec. So is this Turbo Tarot? It was Tarot in the Land of Mysteria, M Y F T R E U M, that I had self published the deck that I designed um, in 2008 and had a just a small 48 page little mini little white book that went with it and um, you know, a little two, two inch by three inch pamphlet kind of um, chat book that went through the cards. But I had talked in an interview in an interview about tarot voice, literally not just academically, intellectually talking about the visual language, literally making the cards speak. And so what I ended up doing is um, just turn my MP3 player on record and walked around my office like I was up on stage and character acted each of the cards. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then literally the hardest part was actually, actually just being a scribe and typing in what I wrote. Because if I flubbed grammar, which is really odd for me, then not correcting that and actually typing those wrong words was almost like torture. And, but I realized though, when that happened, that was kind of a post-it note of, you know, just my psyche going, uh, look right here, look right here. There's something to, you know, dive into. Like it was like an off ramp. And Mm -hmm. so I went through and did them all. And, um, um, but that was tarot and the land of Mysterium. And they put together a box set that has the book and the deck, uh, together. It seems to be available. Yeah, Amazon stores near me. Oh, nice. Is it? That's good. Um, so then <laughs> I just wanted to tell my wife I'm going to go get a haircut after this. <laughs> it took five minutes. <laughs> anyway, that's the way it happens sometimes. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on from the Turo in the land of Mysterium. Um, let us begin with the uh, answer to Job, and we are up to 282, paragraph 282. 682. Um, 682. I am sorry, 682. 682. Right. I don't know if I'm five minutes late and went into a 400 paragraph time warp back in the right. past. <laughs> My mind did anyway. Okay, I'm going to read on here. It is remarkable that the son of man and what he means should be associated again and again with righteousness. It seems to be his leap motif, his chief concern. Only where injustice threatens or has already occurred, does such an emphasis on righteousness make any sense. No one, only God, can dispense justice to any noticeable degree. And precisely with regard to him, uh, there exists the uh, justifiable fear that he may forget his justice. In this case, his righteous son would intercede with him on man's behalf. Thus, the righteous shall have peace. The justice that shall prevail under the son is stressed to such an extent that one has the impression that formerly, under the reign of the father, injustice was paramount, and that only with the son is the era of law and order inaugurated. It looks as though with this, Enoch had unconsciously given an answer to Job. Um, Okay, uh, you wanna comment on this? Either one of you while I look for a document. It's interesting to me that only where injustice threatens or has already occurred does that emphasis on righteousness make any sense that 
something I've noticed, and it's not 100%, but it's pretty close. Is It's like uh, trust never comes up until distrust is present. Right. And justice mm-hmm. doesn't come up until injustice is present. And there's this kind of dyslexic backwards way people bring that into conversation as a <laughs> kind of mirrored confession, as it were. So um, it makes sense to me about the only where injustice threatens has already occurred that righteousness that's the only place righteousness would make sense because you're in a sense pulling the both and in but it's an offhand mirrored reverse in a way oftentimes i mean brian thoughts yeah i mean i was just thinking that that's also in the Tao. you know the, the way of the Tao, yeah um or the Tao of jing is that you know if you don't have you don't have uh criminals until you have laws Yes, <laughs> that's uh, a good etc. You know, you don't, and you don't have laziness until you you require work, uh, kind right. of thing. Right. Um, and what I was looking for is uh, this, which is a page out of the Red Book, uh, which is one of Jung's hit hints. He said um, that some things that he had to say in his time, he could not say. And so here's his image of Philemon uh, on page 154 of the Red Book. The, this is the folio edition I'm talking about, not the, um, not the reader's edition, which has no images, but this is the folio edition. And uh, here he's written in German or in a kind of calligraphy, the Bhagavad Gita says, And he says this in English. It's almost the only Mm. English words that are in the Bhagavad Gita, but he wants to make the point. Whenever there is a decline of the law and an increase of iniquity, then I put forth myself for the uh, refuge of the pious and for the destruction of the evildoer, evildoers uh, for the, uh, establishment of the law i am born in every age and so that's from uh, the bhagavad gita uh and Hmm. so again uh we're seeing it coming through in china in um in hinduism in uh in the bible so the same idea of righteousness um and uh well, that, that's interesting, Brian, with the Tao, and you know, there are no criminals. There are no criminals until there are laws. And what's interesting then is there's a certain subjective quality that's not, not certainly not mythological. It's just philosophical. So it's in in one sense, it's just opinion that starts that. You know, there's, you know, these days we have all this moral this and moral that, and uh, it's usually not that at all. Um, you know what they're not doing by what they're saying they're doing. You know, it's like, <laughs> like to yeah. me, it's like, I laugh that if, if I like you and you say one thing and mean another, you're ironic. If I don't like you, you're a liar. So, you know, it's like, it's that that's the same opinion in the judgment kind of thing. <laughs> well put, Jordan. Yeah, thanks. That's, uh, we have to, uh, Ignore our politics and decide for ourselves. Yeah, that's very much so. And what is what is righteous and what is not righteous? And, uh, yeah, and from what baseline determinant you know is someone making the the relative contrast to say one thing versus another? I mean, right. And so, um, in terms of our current affairs. Uh, Consider the nature of of the participants in the January 6th event and decide whether you would like to have them ruling the United States. Right. <laughs> and and um, if, if you think the Second Amendment of the Constitution will protect your guns if you destroy the Constitution, what are you thinking? <laughs> 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 right yeah yeah i I would say that that there would be a great disarmament 
if if that field you know came into power not people right. but right don't sure. be there would, would be this you know right. rigid uh calling at power and then perceived threat would result in disarmament ironically right and that's exactly what did happen when hitler took power he disarmed his nation um and, and that's the love uh, of power instead of the power of love i mean right it, and, and uh, the other thing he did was um the brown shirts brought him to power uh who are sort of comparable to the january 6th attackers now um, they brought hitler to power and what did he do in the in the night of the long knives, long knives yeah. he executed them all uh including ernst rome who was his biggest supporter and went before the firing squad saying heil hitler um <laughs> so you know people need to know their history and understand what happens when you pull that a stunt like that mm -hmm. um, and so um or people misreading things i saw in a cartoon several weeks back that uh it's this guy and he's holding up both arms and you know completely hairy and and they his wife goes now what are you doing and you need to send that he goes i have the right to bear arms <laughs> and you know so even just changing the inflection like oh wow okay i didn't go there but <laughs> Same spelling. <laughs> same, same spelling, same, <laughs> same order, same punctuation. Absolutely not the same meaning at all. You know, it's oh, right. Um, okay, so paragraph uh, 683. The emphasis laid on God's agedness is logically connected with the existence of a son. But it also suggests that he himself will step a little into the background and leave the government of the human world more and more to the son in the hope that a juster order will emerge. From all this, we can see the after effects of some psychological trauma, the memory of an injustice that cries to heaven and beclouds the intimate relationship with God. God himself wants a son, and man also wants a son to take the place of the father. The mm -hmm. son must, as we have conclusively seen, be absolutely just, and this quality is given priority over all other virtues. God and man both want to escape from blind injustice. And so what do we hear in current affairs right now is uh, the, the younger generation now uh, saying, boy, we're mad and we're gonna take over now. We've had enough of this. And, and they're right because, you know, honestly, you know, my generation, the generation of the first, the leading edge of the baby boom, I was in the first year of the baby boom. Um, but my contemporaries, my classmates have been in control of the US government for 30 years. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and even older as, as, Biden is a bit older than we are. He, he wasn't in the baby boom. He was the last gasp of the last generation. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, for example, the, the chief of naval operations and the commandant of the Marine Corps were both from my year for about 25 years, mm -hmm. ironically. And, uh, so anyway, any other comments on this? Well, you know, I hit, it hits me that, you know, this, this what is opposite of you know, justice and injustice, but then the think about complementarity to justice, at least in the Kabbalistic tree of life is chesed, you know, which is loving kindness. So you have Gavura, this sort of, you know, logos clarity versus this, know other uh more erotic uh, chesed so they you know i think they they i think there is a bringing in train if you're going to activate the field of justice then i think you're also uh -huh. calling the question is there loving kindness 
That's a good point with the two pillars. I mean, severity versus mercy. and the mercy. And then that brings an antiadromia into play, just even in the tree of life of how the, the dance partners are working, so to speak, of that, as you mentioned, one injustice to justice. Um, I'm glad you brought the tree of life because it's such a good image of the. They both look the same, but mercy is so softer a pillar and severity is no harder a pillar, you know, but but they represent, so symbolically, they represent completely different things that are relative to each other, like you said, complementary. And that's 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 important. I mean, it, it feels like if, if something is not, like if life, if, if light is not based in the shadow, it's useless. There's no contrast, there's no distinction, there's no discernment. If dark isn't, you know, laid around light or within, you, it, same thing the other way. I mean, you, it's almost something that's out of context if it doesn't have its opposite present, even in an omissive way that's invisible. I mean, there's kind of a interplay that we need both to actually, actually perceive anything. Right, and um, in, in these years, which go back uh, to more than 500 years before Christ, where, which he's talking about, it was taking a huge amount of time because there was so little communication among groups of people, and there were actually so few people on the planet um, that, that information traveled very slowly. I mean, even uh, the statistic I know is in the 16th century, uh, the average person uh, had as much information provided to him in a lifetime as we have in the New York Times Sunday edition, one paper, one newspaper, um, or one edition of one newspaper. Uh, and so people just didn't have a lot of interaction and therefore these things weren't working in the unconscious yet very actively. I mean, they were working in some people's minds, but it took a long time to percolate out into society. And so, uh, so what Jung is pointing out is that after Job, then Enoch and da Daniel, I mean, those guys were hundreds of years apart, but they gra gradually things developed in the unconscious and um so anyway uh well that actually that that brings to mind to me the graph of the technology curve versus the human evolution curve and the human evolution curve is just kind of you know doing this normal and then you know right around 19, 1900 you know technology curve goes you know straight up yeah and there's the there's it used to be that you could read all the encyclopedias and you could know everything that was on the planet to know. Um, and now, I mean, even if you you know had a good way to remove all the nonsense, you still would be too much in a lifetime. Yeah. So, OK, going on. Paragraph 684. Enoch, in his ecstasy, recognizes himself as the son of man or as the son of God, although neither by birth nor by predestination does he seem to have been chosen for such a role. He experiences that godlike elevation, which in the case of Job, he merely assumed or rather inferred as the inevitable outcome. Job himself seems to have suspected something of the sort when he declares, quote, I know that my vindicator lives, unquote. This highly remarkable statement can, under the circumstances, only refer to the benevolent Yahweh. The traditional Christian interpretation of this passage as an anticipate, anticipation of Christ is correct insofar as Yahweh's uh, benevolent aspect incarnates itself as its own hypostasis in the Son of Man, and in, insofar as the Son of Man proves in Enoch to be representative of justice, and in Christianity, the justifier of mankind. Furthermore, the Son of Man is pre-existent 
and therefore Job could very well appeal to him, just as Satan plays the role of accuser and slanderer. So Christ, uh, God's other son, plays the role of advocate and defender. Um, Okay, comments on that. Okay, what what he's saying by the pre-existence is that both tendencies were already in God. Okay. Yeah, and the hypothesis too is, you know, becoming the essence of rather than um, the entirety of. So it's as if uh, God from concentrate, so to speak. You know. (laughs) (laughs) Just that water. water. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And uh, as we either have seen or will see, Job uh, makes his case to the to the righteous side of God. Mm-hmm. Okay. He advocates himself to the righteous side of God and tries not to cook up the Satan part of God. Right. Right. Anything else here? <laughs> well, the other son, advocate and defender. Um, <laughs> you're, we're still playing... That we're really getting into a development of both and here and not so much mm-hmm. Job. Now Job is in a sense coming to life in context. Um, and then I hate to put it this way, but like in a novel, this, this would almost be a Dana Ma. It's like, oh, wow, we're, we've gotten somewhere in this story. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, Jordan, you want to read 685? Sure. Despite the contradiction, certain scholars have wished to see Enoch's messianic ideas as Christian interpolations. For psychological reasons, this suspicion seems to me unjustified. One only has to consider that Yahweh's injustice, his downright immorality, must have meant to a devout thinker. It was no laughing matter to be burdened with such an idea of God. A much later document tells us of a pious sage who could never read the 89th Psalm because he could not bear it. When one considers with that, when one considers with what intensity and exclusiveness, not only Christ's teaching, but the doctrines of the church in the following centuries down to the present day have emphasized the goodness of the loving father in heaven, the deliverance from fear, the summum bonum, and the privatio boni, one can form some conception of the incompatibility which the figure of Yahweh presents and see how intolerable such a paradox must appear to the religious consciousness. This has probably been so ever since the days of Job. Okay. Brian, you want to comment on this? Yeah, you know, well, I was just thinking, you know, the one, one Psalm 137 is, I think, difficult to bear. Mm-hmm. That's the one that starts, you know, we, we hung up our harps on the trees by uh, the river of Babylon and then ends with, you know, blessed is he who smashes their baby's heads on rocks. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> so I think, yeah, so I think in you know, in the entirety of revelation or the entirety of appreciating the Godhead and the objective psyche that like in the red book, there is, uh, plenty, there are plenty of things with power in there, the archetypes that are um, very, you know, very challenging, immoral, evil, uh, destructive and having no goodwill towards humans. It's like it's all in there. Right. And and this is the genesis of the question that always rises among um, reporters. You know, uh, why does God do bad things like a hurricane or a tornado? Why does God do this? And um, um, Jung would you, used to say that... Um, 
get, talk about the rabbinical story of the creation, which was that God had a had five die in his pocket, and he rolls them out on the floor and says, "Let there be a world," and that was his only input <laughs> to <laughs> what happens in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes. he, he, he had other things to do and uh, and of course the book of job is this thing that where uh, god allows this bet to actually happen in his omniscience he had to know what was the outcome was going to be right but he let he let it play out and uh so, you know, in, in the fullness of time, we can easily see uh, what the final denouement of uh, Donald Trump will be, whether, he, whether it happens now or 30 years from now. Um, you know, he's either going to be flicked off by the God of our time, or we're going to have all the crockery broken and then yeah. He, he'll, his ilk will be flicked off once again. Uh, I'm not saying that democracy will be saved, but um, an, a new way of looking at the world will emerge. And, and that's what the Bhagavad Gita predicted over 5,000 years ago, and uh, Confucius probably even earlier than that. Um, so do you have the book, Brian? I do. Okay, so would you read uh, six? Oh, you have something, Jordan? Uh, yeah, just one thing before we move on to six eighty six. Um, it's interesting, you know, growing up in you know, the omniscient God, and then you you start reading Young, and you realize of the and you had you know absolute total respect. This is a being that sees all, knows all. It's like, wow, you know, that's this is so magnetic. And then you get the unconscious God, and within about two seconds, you go, oh. So we have a savant omniscient. Um, uh, my respect level just kind of went, you know, and, and it wasn't such a majesty kind of thing anymore. And honestly, it, it dehumanized. It didn't even humanize. It took it even below where I'm going, this is someone who's walking around sleepwalking. And I'm supposed to respect or even interact that's that's like the angels who don't see the people and they they hurt them because they bump into them you know i mean it's like it, what are the what's the sleepwalker deity thing you know so I mean, it's interesting how you know over growing up how that would evolve between what's omniscient but then you add unconscious to omniscience and it makes more sense because they're both pure in a way they're you know untouched by others but when you put them together, it's like, man, that doesn't work so hot, you know? Right, or even just the, <laughs> I think it gives rise to, you know, the the, the Gnostic idea of a demiurge. Like, that's actually right. not the real God. Yeah. This exactly. one we're dealing with in this uh, set of revelations, it is not it. That's a great point. And, and he thinks it's it. And that's right. part of the problem. Um, so we get the flawed perception piece of um, considering something something when that something is nowhere anywhere near the context. I mean, so you're the trickery, you know, the the low key, as it were, of you know how I we perceive. Right. 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 I'm I'm just uh, looking for one of the images from Ye. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Blake, William Blake, uh, which God is explaining himself here. Um, and uh, I'll just show you here. Um, so looking down with the golden triangle. Or... Right. Oh, I just have to get it up on the screen. Here, here should be. Okay, so here's God talking to Job, Job's underneath God here, and he's pointing out, uh, God is making, pointing out all the mistakes he had to make in order to get <laughs> to where, where Job is. And so 
he's got behemoths and leviathan here uh, as one of the um, as one of the one of the mistakes that he made. And uh, let's see. Well, or even <clears throat> sort of acceptable, un unintended or non-purposeful yeah. side effects. So right. for instance, you have people trying to explain the benefit of underarm hair, <laughs> yeah. hair. And it's just a side effect of testosterone. So whatever we get from testosterone right. has the survival benefit. The, the unintended, the point of it is not to have underarm hair, you know, or in men or women, you know, estrogen and progesterone. That's not the intended effect. They, those are just like tolerable side effects that don't, uh, you know, in the end, when you do all the math, allow for survivability and, you know, reproduction and continuing the lineage. So they don't have to have a purpose. Right. Hurricanes don't have to have a purpose. They're just part of, to get all this in a pleroma, hurricanes right. come with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's right. not like, and I'm going to do a hurricane to do something. It's like, no, like, if you want to have a planet like this, that, you know, has weather and rain and, you know, seasons, hurricanes are built in. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not for hurric if you want to like eliminate hurricanes, you can eliminate a whole bunch of other things and maybe it's not consistent with life. Yeah. And maybe, well, maybe you eliminate us when you do right. that. Yeah. But maybe we, I, yeah. So maybe we need hurricanes, just like the herd of, uh, you know, wildebeest need the lion tribe. Yeah. Right. Right, the and, gardener, so to speak, to, to right. weed, to cull, and to grow. Yeah, it's interesting if we, up, if we look at up. the Earth, we needed the collision of of that other planetoid system that ultimately turned into the Moon. We needed that because it's the it's the tides and the and the flowing back and forth of the tides which created life itself, mm -hmm. um, and so. I mean, if you so it's like a balanced unidirectional pendulum that keeps the system going, you know, it keeps the car turned on, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting you brought up body hair because I remember um, years back, my beard wasn't this long, but someone said, well, you know what people think about beards? And I said, well, I know a lot of people think about a lot of things. So what, what, which a lot of things are you going to talk about? And, and uh, they uh, he said, well, you know, what are you covering up? Um, people don't trust people with beards. And I said, you know, I don't trust the fact that you don't, you haven't read history. People who don't trust people with beards or mustaches, that is an eroded idea. It's actually a, more intense than that. People with beards used to be considered heretics. So mm -hmm. distrust is kind of a diet version of her heresy. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I suggest you go back and, you know, in time before you start accusing me of, you know, what am I covering up? Because it's not Halloween today. So this is no mask. You mm -hmm. know, but it's like, it's funny because then just about someone having that perception, I can't trust you because. Yeah. Well, who told and, them that? You yeah. Know? And, and meanwhile, if you were a Sikh, you wouldn't trust people without beards. <laughs> without, exactly. Why are they cutting that off? Right. <clears throat> yeah. And, and uh, because you're cutting off nature. I mean, it's such, you know, it's it's like an acidic Jew has, well, they're not going to cut those because it's, it's a sacred nature that comes yeah. from. from and, why, and why do Sikhs not have their hair cut? Do you know, Brian? I do not. I just thought that was, it's interesting. I don't know. Okay. Well, well, there there are a few, there. I think there are five things that a Sikh must have and uh one of them is a beard because w with a beard and a mustache uh they could be recognized in battle as a sikh and mm. the second and the second thing was um not to cut their hair um and that goes along with the third thing which is a turban and the turban is used to wrap the hair over the head. And what is that? That's an early helmet for mm. battle. Okay. And, um, and then every Sikh has a, uh, a dagger too, and they have to have some form or of a dagger. Yeah, a blade. A blade, yeah. Yeah, um, I served in the, I was in the 
Army Reserve National Guard system um, as the other half of my military career. And we had a, an officer, he was, a, he was a light bird and he was a Sikh. So he wore a turban and had a beard and he wore a bracelet that what had enough of an edge to it going around, you know, the outer facing part was an edge that counted. So he couldn't oh, carry a sword. The blade. But he was allowed to have that as his blade. Right. Interesting. Okay, now Susan makes a interesting point. Um, and uh, and so does Wanda. So let's talk about those. <laughs> Uh, Susan says it is difficult for me to square in my mind the idea that God is both omniscient and unconscious. I understand rationally uh, there is a part of me that wants the divine to be without a shadow. Um, and of course, that's Jung's point is that we've taught all Westerners to have God not have a shadow. Right. Right. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, so Satan gets kicked out of heaven, uh, right at the time of Christ and falls to earth. Right. And, um, and so that's Christianity, uh, knocking Satan out of, out of the uh, Royal court, but you know, many Christians think that uh, Christ was the first son of God, but he wasn't. Satan was the first son of God. <laughs> yeah, you started getting the Cain and Abel thing, the repeat. And yeah, it's season two, as it were. And it's interesting about the conscious and, um, and omniscient piece, because I think we're led to, if something doesn't have a shadow, it's untrustworthy. It's incredulous, you know, and the vampire. Yeah, because yeah. it's all potential and it's it's fake. It's not real. And it reminds me of a, a one of Winston Churchill's interview candidates who his first question was, well, sir, you come with high recommendations. Um, so tell me about your vices. And, you know, Churchill wasn't trying to out him. He was just trying to play, OK, what damage control and marketing and what do I need to stock in your cabinets, you know, kind of thing. And um, this, the man responded, he goes, well, Prime Minister, I, uh, I'm an outstanding gentleman. I, I have no vices. He goes, oh, either you're a liar or you're that boring. I can have neither of those in my cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. One exactly. that says, uh, well, I think the idea is the inner is the inner God. Jung was speaking of the God archetype in Yahweh. And mm -hmm. yes, Wanda, you're quite right. And what we're going through is um, Jung's sort of laying this out for the average mm -hmm. um, average right. person. And so you're obviously well ahead of, um, of the average person who might be listening to this, but we have to go through this painful process of discussing all these things. We can't, we can't just, uh, you know, logically say, well, this is it. And this is what, what Jung means. Uh, no, it's not like that. It's because nobody would believe us. Uh, you have to believe it for yourself first. And, um, well, and Wanda's so point we're, not, we're not, you know, uh, you're, you're correct, uh, Wanda, in terms of your perspective, but it's, um, um, you're, it's, basically because you're knowledgeable <laughs> and one well, yeah and, wanda's point is well taken too because sure. honestly this is another repeat of lilith jesus is another lilith because there's a birth of consciousness metaphor in the creation of jesus you know from mm -hmm. the unconscious yeah lilith anyway. uttering the ineffable was the first choice so to speak so she's she's consummating consciousness for then, you know, the apple will be bitten and birth consciousness there. So it's as if, you know, Lilith and Eve are birthing the feminine consciousness and they come first. And then Jesus comes, you know, and Satan come later. Well, so that's unconsciousness 
that's causing the birth of consciousness. So I, I like you know Wanda pulling that up back with the with the unconscious and omniscient becomes the potentiality rather yeah. than the eventual you know the eventuality of Jesus as the let us Eve you know but right. uh, the birth of consciousness metaphor there. So Wanda is making a number of other interesting points, including admitting it, that I've outed her. She says. I was lucky enough to study with a student of Robert A. Johnson. Yeah, I had eight years of analog analysis, so I did take it did take me a while and did uh, blow my mind as blow my mind. I think as well at first. Then she says Jesus is Sophia, um, and uh, yes, Jesus does represent Sophia. Uh, in the in the sense of wisdom um and well and then the iasos you know the latin doesn't have a j so it would be i with the iasos i said so i e o s u s i mean however that part that particular spelling of jesus is is so close to ichthyos the fish which then there's sophia the inner wisdom and so that's yeah that's a very good point that jesus becomes sophia so again we have another trickster you know, what, why are we being presented a male when the reality is female? And it's not, unfortunately, it wasn't to protect the female. It was hiding, you know. And so if you have love of power, it was protecting the female with a trickster in the you know, front. But if you have power, if you have love of power, it's not protecting. It's, right. it's erasing. And, and so uh, everybody needs to look at Proverbs 8. Um and in your Bible, and there you will find um, either wisdom or Sophia, not both. Some right. translations refer to it as Sophia, and some refer to it as um, wisdom. And of course, the ones that have it as wisdom are from the patriarchy. <laughs> and but uh, but it's the feminine principle uh, that's uh, that's at work here. So that's what. Um, well, also the evolution of the language, as um, I, her name is skipping me, the icon uh, iconographer that we had on the Wisdom Path a couple of years ago, um, who took us from um, Southern. Europe or you right. know Africa all, and, all through the development of Sophia right and yeah going up to Nov Novogorod and right the, the evolution the etymology of the word began with Hokma you know mm -hmm. and then evolved um, to Greece at Sophia but then this is when the trouble started then it evolved to Numa P-N-E-U-M-A but thing is so Hokma and Sophia are both very powerful feminine nouns. Numa is a neutral noun. So that's kind of the preamble, the, mm -hmm. the foreshadowing to then it goes to logos, which is a masculine noun. And then the coffin sealed when it switches then further to spiritus sanctus, which is in a higher octave masculine noun. So when you watch that transformation of going from Sophia to spiritus sanctus, it's, it's not a higher spirit. It's, it's, a further and further instability of mm -hmm. in the female, which is absolutely, you know, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's a tragedy. Right. And it leaves it, it leaves behind in the dust, you know, the song of Solomon, which is, yes. uh, you know, a, a logos Eros. Well, I think Eros comes out of the, the Shekhinah and, you know, this, uh, what, what do you think is the embodiment of the male, uh, persona in because uh, <clears throat> this is written you know before Christ right but there's this you know very erotic you know interplay of love between you know wisdom right and I don't know if it's quite logos but it seems like the eroticism you know develops between them mm, and then when right. you, when you banish you know Shahina then all you have is this male principle, right. no love. 
Right. And yeah, and it, the story repeats that basically the twin, the, ero the erotic quality of the twins throughout, where you get Eros and Narcissus, or mm -hmm. Echo, not Eros, e Echo and Narcissus. Mm -hmm. And he hears himself enough, so to speak, echoed, that he finally is able to look up. So she doesn't pull him out of his reflection. But after, you know, after a while, literally, they resurrect each other instead of her being incarcerated to watch him watch himself. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> you know, she gets liberated when he looks up and he gets liberated when he looks up and they both liberate each other because they both look up and into each other. And then that's when that, you know, that happens again. Like, and you're right with the Shekinah, the female portion of the, the original Godhead, which is the creatrix, the, the original generative principle. Right. Um, and I have to refer back yeah. to this book, uh, The Radiant Sutras uh, by Lauren Roche. Wait a minute here. Oh, well. There. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, anyway, the radiant, oh, the radiant Sutras. Um, you can find it on, on um, Amazon. But <clears throat> on the back cover here, it says uh, the roar of joy that set the world in motion is reverberating in your body and the space between all bodies, beloved, listen. And uh, then uh, the, the most important paragraph in this book, which is in the introduction, it seems to me, uh, although the whole book is just beautiful. And uh, my wife and I actually bought a, a Toyota Prius this color and we call her radiance <laughs> but because of this book. Um, and when I got this book, um, my, uh, my wife has a hard time hearing me sometimes. And so the only way I could get her to read it was I had to buy another copy and send it to her in her name from Amazon as a gift, gift wrapped. <laughs> that she had to look at it. So anyway, uh, the language of love. The Bhareva Tantra is set as a conversation between the goddess, who is the creative power of the universe, and the god, who is consciousness that permeates everywhere. For short, they call each other Devi and Bhareva, or Shakti and Shiva, they are lovers and inseparable partners, and one of their fa favorite places to, of dwelling is in the human heart. Um, mm -hmm. So Shakti and Shiva. Um, and I, so I think going back to the the two original questions of the the two YouTube viewers. Yeah, I'm not seeing them. I think we have to remember there is there's the, objective psyche, there is uh, those things that are, uh, that have connection to things like animals, but then there's meaning behind that. So there's animal spirit. And then there are the spirits of place. And then there are the spirits that don't have, you know, manifestation in the physical reality. Yeah. I mean, these are all sort of, you know, Russian doll kinds of all the things supernatural. And then we have a Western God complex. Right. That, you know, it, it encloses some of this, of the divine and the supernatural, but not all of it. Right. So this, you know, so we, I think most of us, I can assume that we grew up with a God complex that did not encompass all sorts well, of things. And, and I, so, I have to acknowledge how difficult this was for me to get my mind around this because the first time I read Ion uh, and I got to chapter five of it, um, which is entitled God as a Symbol of the Self, I said to myself, uh, whoa, are you talking about the son of God here? Or Jesus as the... Jesus as a symbol of the self. And I said, whoa, you know, are you talking about the son of God? And uh, 
you know, so I read the chapter, but it, it just kind of bounced off, off me and it took me 10 years to get my mind around it, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's just my testimony of how hard it is mm -hmm. for Westerners. And, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a Bible thumping Christian, but, um, but I, you know, even for me, that attitude permeated into my life somehow. I, you know, of course I did do a bunch of things in the church, um, but, you know, I haven't been to church on a regular basis for 37 years at this point. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I can't say that I'm a Bible thumping Christian, but I literally bounced off that chapter until, um, until I could get myself into Jung. And then, then I, then I got it, then I grokked it. Well, even that 10, that decade of a process to me is really important because regardless of time, um, I know, right. When I hit that chapter, my fr the first thing out of my mouth was finally and but the thing is what we both did is we shed a skin we molted and yeah. you know brian your point of the russian dolls the nesting dolls you know the, there's always one more inside the onion skinning no matter how time much you peel an onion it's still an onion it's still an onion but the thing is the evolution of you know that decade process that you shed that skin to find the deity as it were, a new, and I think that perspective formation, and you know where you're coming at it. I was, I was trying to shirk it, trying to throw it off. There was like a yoke I just didn't buy. So I kind of almost come from the ten years before of being the other way, but but trapped just in the same way because I was trying to get off the yoke rather than. And so it's just same. It's almost a concept coming. You know, all roads lead to Rome, and but both is the that nesting doll, the onion skinning, and the molting, as it were. Mm -hmm. But if what we know since childhood is this, I say, God, you imagine X, right? You know that that immediacy of apprehension. Uh, this is God right here. I, I so I think that. Most of us in the West, our God that we can say, what well, you know, think God is going to be this pure, not evil, you know, but all the things we've been saying. And right. yet in other, you know, spiritual traditions, the cultural complex for God or God's, you know, encompasses other other things and have their own shadows and and but ours being so tightly bound to no evil you know well, mono the mono theistic versus the pantheon you know i right. mean and even pantheon you can lose the word pantheistic and it's pantheon because it's alive and it's look at all the characters but monotheistic well it doesn't have a lot of characters it has one that mm -hmm. is allegedly all except, but not any of that evil stuff, right? You know, and as you, get, you, you start to yeah. play that, that tricky game again. Well, God, we have to remember that God um, created everything and is everything. Uh, you know, it's the, uh, it, God is this point, uh, this, whose circumference is everywhere and whose um, physical manifestation not, is nowhere or something like that. I don't remember. And, yeah, exactly. and then it, the, the circumference is everywhere, the dimension is nowhere, and the center is rarely in the middle, I think. Yeah. So. And it reminds me, I mean, the, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but the sui generis, which is S-U-I, the G-N-E-R-I-S, you know, that which comes into being all of its own accord of itself that did not exist prior. So that's like a quark coming out of nowhere. How'd that happen? How did a thing come from nothingness? So there's this, until you get to the concept of the void as the womb, 
and mm -hmm. that's generative. But the problem is then it's not the first thing again, you know? Okay. So you, you, you get that's the time, nice. the time contradiction there. And, and I think the way I finally went, Hmm, I slowed it down and literally picked up my compass when I was an architect and I put the point down and I started drawing a circle slowly and it's a curved arc. It's a curved arc. It's a curved arc. It doesn't become a circle until the lead passes over the lead. Mm -hmm. Then there's no beginning and no end, but in that micro several seconds of scribing the lead across the paper, I see a beginning and I see the end except right when the lead touches the lead, that's the snake biting its tail, the birth of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now it's a circle, it's a thing. So mm -hmm. I always kind of wonder about what is the lead arc on the way to, you know, that which is divine creating itself and self-creating from nothing. I mean, it, right. it still so, doesn't solve the time problem though. So it's, it's, Okay, I, I have to take a, a moment of a reflection here because Wanda has said, uh, I also asked for prayer for my friend Jay Pittman McGeehee, uh, mm. who is recovering from a serious illness. Um, and uh, he is uh, a dear man. He wrote, uh, the, he wrote the inner church. And uh, let's see. And she says, uh, just let's just say that Jungian thought saved my life. And, I, um, and she says, he is an Episcopal priest and analyst. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I think that uh, Jungian thought uh, probably saved my life too, is, is uh, the truth of it. Because if I... Um, I did not have an inclination toward psychotherapy or analysis. So if I hadn't uh, found Jung and had uh, his guidance over the last now, uh, well, at least 35 years, I would have, uh, I would have crashed a long time ago, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And uh, I would agree that the Freudian single-mindedness, which is just, you know, just stuff, intellectual matter. And I'm like, why are you always explaining yourself? Is, is philosophy a surrogate parent to you? When are you going to grow up? Become, you know, and, and, but I had nothing other than that. I couldn't, there were no allies. So you're kind of alone in calling out the ivory tower until you finally <laughs> realize that you're in the ivory tower. And if you just leave the ivory tower, you'll find, oh, look, Carl Jung's there on the ground hey, let's go take a walk, you know, I mean, and it saved my life because there, everything. There, there's a reason that um, Jung's face is on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's uh, Lonely Heart Cl Hearts Club band album cover. Right. Uh, the he, you know, because all of us who find our own way uh, with our, our spiritual condition, um are lonely we're all lonely because we all have a different perspective but anyway can uh, because i would like to at least get to jesus here and he's only two paragraphs <laughs> away so <laughs> yeah let's keep the keep the lead moving on this what we call a circle right. thing yeah. we'll call it a circle so yet. brian 686 <laughs> The inner instability of Yahweh is the prime cause not only of the creation of the world, but also of the pyramidic drama for which mankind serves as a tragic chorus. <clears throat> the encounter with the creature changes the creator. In the Old Testament writings, we find increasing traces of this development from the 6th century BC on. The two main climaxes are formed firstly by the Job tragedy, and secondly, by Ezekiel's revelation, Job is the innocent sufferer, but Ezekiel witnesses the humanization and the differentiation of Yahweh. By being addressed as son of man, it is intimated to him that Yahweh's incarnation and quaternity are, so to speak, the pluramatic model for, which, for what is going to happen. 
to the transformation and humanization of God, not only to God's Son as foreseen from all eternity, but to man as such. This is fulfilled as an intuitive anticipation in Enoch. In his ecstasy, he becomes the son of man in the Pleroma and has wafting away and his wafting away in a chariot like Elijah prefigures the resurrection of the dead. To fulfill his role as minister of justice, he must get into immediate proximity to God and as the pre-existing son of God, he is no longer subject to death, but in but insofar son as... Son of man. So, oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, pre-existing son of man. Pre-existing son of man. He is no longer subject to death, but in, insofar as he was an ordinary human being and therefore mortal, other mortals as well as he can attain to the vision of God they too can become conscious of their savior and consequently immortal. You know, and that last line, I don't know what it is, but the inner translator in me wants to just go, wait, which of those words came from antiquity and was unfortunately modified incorrectly? I mean, the immortal piece, there's a whole piece here where it feels like there's something hiding in that last line. And, and that's, that would enhance it. I'm not trying to go against it. Um, but they're almost like this feels a little logacy. The, they too can become conscious of their savior. Okay, well, hmm, of their savior, what's, what's this concept? And then consequently immortal. Okay, is that inherently a quality of a savior, or are these two? I don't know. There's just a lot of dance in the, that last line that seems to be pretty, pretty loaded that could be unpacked. And I, I don't know. I don't know. This is kind of an intimation, I, I, and I don't know where to go with it. So I, I, I'll just stop right there. <laughs> I'll just well, hit the pause. Well, I wonder. Not everyone gets visions. Yeah. Not everyone. Uh, you know, can have the. There you go. Say that you know the. Yeah, I guess visions. Not everybody gets a, a supernatural experience, but if God incarnates, then, you know, we can all at least imagine seeing. There you go. God. Right. Thank you. Maybe that is what you know. This whole idea of you know being saved and having eternal life and all that is maybe intimating. I think that I like the way you put that because then it, it's a, it's a repenting of the, the Phoenix story, but in right. a, a, more, a more broad way with more distinctions. We, we only have to go to our own families to realize that, um, you know, mortality is just a word. Uh, that Im immortality is actually the, the rule of the day, um, if you understand what's being said. Uh, because as I often say, you know, the, my parents and my brother both live in me exactly as they did during life. They haven't, that hasn't changed whatsoever, uh, not, not a blink and um, and so the fact that you know I am what I am or who I am um, again um, has an effect down through the generations in my in my family. And, and that's that's expressed in the numinous quality of memories as blessings. Yeah, memory is what. Memories as blessings. Right. May their memory become be a, be as a blessing. Be a yeah, blessing, exactly. yes. Um, and, and so, and whether that memory is a conscious memory or an unconscious memory uh, makes not a fig of difference, okay? Because uh, we are all um, 
the manifestation of all of the hopes and fears of all of our ancestors, whether conscious or unconscious, going back to single-celled mm -hmm. organisms, okay, all the way back. And, um, and when we recognize that, um, then we can, you know, play our part as, as any creature or living thing does. I mean, in the same sense that an apple plays its part by becoming a, a ripe fruit and then is picked and, and becomes human. Okay, in other words, um, you know, when um, I remember David White, the famous uh, Irish poet, mm -hmm. once talking about how he, he was chasing a pea around his, his uh, pot because he couldn't capture it and get it in, into his dish. And he, he finally says, well, come on, P, this is your chance to become a human being. <laughs> right? And to have consciousness. <laughs> and, <laughs> right? And... Uh, Hurting peas, it's like... Right. And, and so um, no living thing actually dies in that sense. And and uh, anything that we consume, all life lives on other life. And, you know, we all survive on other life. And, you know, every, everything in your grocery store was once alive, unless you're talking about the light bulb section, <laughs> you know, or the, or the <clears throat> school supply section. But if you're talking about actual <laughs> food sure. stuff, if you're talking about food stuff, it was all alive at one point, <clears throat> every bit of it. And so the only difference between uh, a carnivore and a vegetarian is that the carnivore has never heard a, a tomato scream <clears throat> or a vegetarian has never heard a <laughs> tomato scream, right? But in point of fact, we are we all are moving life forward one way or night another so it's uh rather amusing my my wife caught me up on this about 40 years ago when i asked her how to think about the abortion debate and she said well um life doesn't begin at uh conception life began three and a half billion years ago <laughs> well and i know people who think that you know it's not a viable embryo until it graduates from med school so. <laughs> uh, yeah and um, well, speaking to was it wanda or the other woman's comment in youtube about the spaces between that comes up to me with a you know, when you die, you know, your matter becomes energy, even if that's true, and it goes out to the universe. That's the energy that's in the space between and even the four character voice of the universe, the ah, who, mm, you know, um, in the hey, silence. yeah, mm -hmm. AUM with the sounds and people say, well, why did you call that the four character voice of the universe? There are only three letters. And it's like, well, the fourth voice is the capital S silence of the space between within and all around. So that's where that energetic, you know, ocean, as it were, is the, the recycling, you know, the, coming back to. So I, I kind of wonder a concept I've been playing with for 30 years is uh, matter is just spent light, like the particle and wave fell out of solution. And so the wave goes away and precipitates, you know, and, and then the, the actual then the, you know, the, the light, the part of the wave part of it will becomes the heartbeat. And so, and then, but there's a cycle back to the space between and the energetic, the synapse, the void, um, that interest is space between it seems to be so important so that again, we contextualize matter into nothingness. So right. we have a contrast again. So, so, so here, here's an interesting debate. Um, Justin says, does the fact that I live in a wooden cottage mean that I live in a corpse? Patrick says, ah, 
And Wanda says, I see no point in an afterlife if we don't retain a personality. Well, um, we, we surely <laughs> maintain a personality. Is there any doubt that Carl Jung, his per personality lives on after him? Uh, it surely does. Um, and You know, there, it's interesting. That's a really interesting comment, because even if I take a look at... Um, how the pharaohs were buried. You know, they removed all the organs and put them in canopic jars and there's all that, but they removed the heart and put a, um, a heart scarab in, you know, size of your fist out of lapis or something else. But on the underside, there were seven lines and it was the, the alchemy of the removal of the heart, but this was their boarding pass. And this was so they didn't make a mistake and didn't get into eternity and, and didn't get into the afterlife because this said everything that needed to happen from their heart. And they put that heart scarab into the body. Mm -hmm. So you know, when Ma'at weighs the heart against you know feather, it's not about you know, the feather weighs 1.6 grams and the heart weighs a pound. It's the buoyancy of the heart. But there was this, you know, they're cheating. They put the, a story on the back of the scarab unseen so that those who are the keepers of the afterlife would let them in to make sure that you know things they went you know the trouble to do happen which tells me wow you got some that's a serious bouncer to get past you know and they're so what kind of people are you know what's this where's this they're going to so even beyond personality i mean there's almost this I think that there's no point in an afterlife if you don't have a personality because um, it's not just season two, you know, it's. <laughs> well, you, you surely retain a personality. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, you know, I can, I can talk about, everybody's heard me talk about my grandparents and their personalities. And so those personalities surely live. Um, and, you know, we, I can say the same thing about, uh, and, I, and we can see those in photographs, for example, like photographs of my grandfather when he and grandmother, when they were young, for example, really expressed their personalities. But, um, and that's why imagery is so important. Um, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, th I think my point, I think with the Pharaoh and the heart scare was that I think that personality at that point, there's going to be a drastic milestone in the moment evolution of that personality, capital B personality in a way. I mean, because the idea of, you know, once you, when you get older and then you look back, instead of complaining about this, that or the other, you realize while you were growing up, you were witnessing your parents growing up too, you know, right. and when you get that, there's a different level of empathy and not just compassion, but of understanding about. So I like that idea of if yeah. there's if we don't have a personality in the afterlife, what's the point? You know, it's right. like a kid going to a birthday party and saying, well, what do you mean there's no cake? It's a birthday party. What's the point? So I, I would agree if there's no personality in the afterlife. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't now, Mohit Sani says, um, is Aspects of Feminine a good book to start young? I would say uh, almost assuredly no. Uh, the best place to start young is in um, Man and His Symbols, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another alternative would be to start with Memory Streams Reflections. Yeah, the, the only problem with Memory Streams Reflections, though, is young kind of throws you in and you have to sink or swim whereas in answer and man and his symbols and you need the hardbound version of it and uh if you don't have access to our dropbox uh please write to me and i will give you access to our dropbox because our generic dropbox not the advanced reading group dropbox um but our generic dropbox has um, you know the collected works of C.G. Young in electronic form, but it also has the uh, hardbound version 
of man and his symbols, which contains the color plates. And without that, it's very hard to follow. I have both the hardbound and the paperback, and the paperback is is not very useful, unfortunately, because it's mm -hmm. black and white symbols, and they don't actually include them all, uh, which is surprising. Um, I actually recommend the, the go the memory streams reflections route because to me diving in the shallow end is dangerous it's the best way to break your neck so I'd rather dive in the deep end and know that I'm not going to get hurt even though I might be a little whelmed at times um, so but I and that's where I started I mean I had a the dean of the graduate school and my undergraduate thesis just boom pop memory streams reflections down on my desk and it goes I want to have a conversation about this tomorrow. Stop drawing, read this. You know, and I was doing a house for myself that was called the Temple and Man. And I had never seen Jung. Well, that was the last day of me never seeing Jung again. You know, I mean, it's, I stayed up all night, just read and read and read and read and reread. And the next day he comes in, he goes, Oh, good. You stayed up. You're really exhausted. This will be a better conversation. <laughs> so, you know, cause I'm a little bit on the delirious side, you know. Um, but it was quite, yeah, it was quite the deep dive and, and okay. quite the surprise. You know, and, and, and I would say just bear in mind that, <clears throat> that I think it's very human and that's what you, to pay attention to, that this is a person who, you know, has these experiences and sort of they, some remain inexplicable until later. And so, you know, I think it's very much like people's lives, but, you know, like, it's odd, not as odd as a red book, <laughs> but right. you know, there's, there's, uh, I don't know, there's, there's some, you know, not quite shock value, but I think things that will sort of make you seem this guy is kind of odd. Um, well, the, yeah, jarring would be a good word. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, but, but that that's how you know that's how it works. But don't, uh, so don't stop there. Yeah, but I like the I like you putting it that way. It's very human because it's not autobiographical in the I'm going to be told a story. This is an experience that it's going to unfold in front of you of someone honestly courageous enough and unthreatened enough, strong enough to be gentle, fierce enough to be compassionate, and then go. No, this is what I did. No embarrassment. No nothing. Just this is what it is here. So I, I realize I, I really like that, that it's more human, but because of it, it's also way more intense. You know, it's there's no happy daffy human there. That's this is a real messy person. And and to me, there's more order in messy. You know, you, you something to sink your teeth into. Right. So we're one paragraph away from Jesus. One paragraph. <laughs> I'll cover the last paragraph. All, right. All these ideas could easily have become conscious at the time uh, on the basis of the assumptions then current, if only someone had seriously reflected on them, but that no Christian interpolation were needed. Uh, the Book of Enoch was an, anticipate, an anticipation in the grand manner, but everything still hung in midair as mere revelation that never came down to earth. In the view of these facts, one cannot, with the best will in the world, see how Christianity, as we hear over and over again, is supposed to have burst upon the world history as an absolute novelty. If ever anything had been historically prepared and sustained and supported by the existence existing Weltschauung, uh, Christianity would be a classic example. Okay, so um, Jesus. this is an important paragraph because it, to me, actually, this just put together something I hadn't I hadn't really thought of, but Julian Julian Jane's the psychologist Julian Jaynes' book, um, the, the Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Mm -hmm. And the bicameral mind would see voices, thoughts as voices. Everything was internal, external, but it was not the person. It was a third person. 
uh, perspective as if this was outside or an influence, whether it came from within or outside. But that's the polytheistic piece. But what's interesting here is that the monotheism is not just the one God. It's taking the whole of that pantheon and making it one. So in a sense, it kind of pomegranates it, you know, with the seeds inside and um, more so even than an apple, you know, use the five seeds or what have you. But um, going from the unconscious by cameral mind to the conscious with it, the breakdown of the bicameral mind wasn't a pulling apart, but a consolidation were, of all the parts into one identity. And I, well, and I think too that, you know, the hardcore monotheism cannot stand, it cannot hold. Right. You, it creates a Satan and it also creates a son of man mm -hmm. and it also creates a virgin and a pantheon of saints. Right. Sure. Um, you know, an angel, right. there, it, it can't contain it all. Yeah, it's always on the verge of the dandelion exploding. You know, I mean, it, just, it can't, it can't stay. You know, the one thing, and also too, that's lonely. It's shameful. It's um, punishment. There's an incarceration to oneness. Mm -hmm. I mean, the difference between loneliness and solitude. Solitude is wonderful. I mean, that's cool. Loneliness is then you have anxiety associated with the separation. Solitude's connected, and you know, loneliness is anxious. And disconnected and you're right because that it's always going to come back to this pantheon and of characters and characteristics is it in genesis why what is the impetus for making man is it because god is lonely that's in yeah in there i i need a companion or something is that not it hmm I think he says, like, either to himself or maybe an angel standing there, you know. Unconscious of, so he doesn't realize he's not alone. <laughs> it's like, but I thought there was something in Genesis um, that, oh, maybe that's about Adam. Sorry. That Adam. Well, yeah. I'm glad you kind of dropped back to Genesis because then all of a sudden I, I go, well, where the heck Shekinah ever? Mm -hmm. we know the female portion of the original godhead but so genesis is starting but i should before i continue the sentence i, I probably should pick up and read it again to, but is she in there i mean it, it's all this dude making stuff you know i mean <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well now uh, yeah she's in there she's in there and but, certainly you know, in Proverbs, she she says explicitly that she was there. You know, but in Genesis, I mean, I mean, it's, it's certainly in Proverbs, but. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit she, of a conundrum. That's why I want you to, it wants you to reflect upon it. Well, yeah, and I, I think that the thing is to me is how the heck did the female Godhead get so minimized? And then when it does appear, gets so demonized. I mean, well, my... because because um, Jesus became um, what's the word for bisexual? It, it, or not bisexual, but both. Hermaphroditic? Huh? Is he hermaphrodite? Does he? Yeah, hermaphroditic. Yeah, and and so that was enough at the time. And uh, Jung says it in its very next sentence in 688, which I'm not sure I want to get to today uh, because it will divert the discussion. But uh, Jesus first appears as a Jewish reformer and prophet of an exclusively good God, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's sort of a, a feminine way of thinking about God because obviously um we men keep destroying the world with wars and the women keep putting it back together <laughs> and that's that's very clear um now there's a sort of an amusing um, I think, 
before we move on, I mean, okay. to that, if we would, I mean, the hermaphroditic piece is, I think, really important, especially today with all the binary, non-binary, trans, this, that. And ancient cultures, a hermaphrodite or someone who's trans would naturally be pulled into the medicine person position. They were held sacred in ancient native cultures as they were the incarnation of the both hand rather than being some kind of novelty, they, they were uplifted in those societies and celebrated as um, innately wise from birth. So, I mean, you know, I think the whole, like Jesus doesn't bear arms. Jesus suffers the little children where I think in most patriarchal cultures, men don't even think about their kids until they're, you know, they're, right. They're initiated and they're older, um, but I think it, that's some of that manifestation of containing things, not just you know, Iron Age, uh, you know, man yeah. from antiquity and a patriarchy. Yeah, because I mean, it's like the Iranian piece of you know, and men hardly thought about their children, well, unless they were going to bang their head on the rock biblically or eat them. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> killing your young and it's like, well, wait, 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 wait. That's that's not what everyone. But you're right. I mean, this is, the men would leave the house. I mean, even going hunting when the kid's small, you're always leaving. You're always leaving. And mm -hmm. but then there's always returning. But you're right. The kids aren't the focus. Right. OK, I want to. Um... I want to go over and pay some attention to the YouTube chat here uh, because it has a couple of administrative details that we need to address. Uh, a person who styles themselves as a Braxa, so yeah, great, <laughs> <laughs> says, uh, maybe you could take a pragmatic look at the graphene oxide poison aspect of the so-called vaccine and discuss the merits of forced injection of poison. Well, Abraxas, no, we won't, because this is a uh, discussion about Carl Jung and, and his works. And um, so- Anything poison is in too right, much purity. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, the idea of a poison can be raised with many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, discuss, you know, the merits of forced injection of what poison. Is going on. Oh, Brad says, no, we won't, because this is a uh, discussion about that ghost. There we go. What was that? That was you? Oh, no, that was, I think Brian had, it was a beautiful echo of what you just said. So <laughs> yeah. delay. Okay, but but the point is, delay got the yeah, and, um, you know, poison is used in medicine every which way but loose. So that's what chemotherapy is for cancer among other things and so almost every medicine is toxic right yeah and, and, and every every goes. every surgery every surgery is cutting away a part of your natural body or something like that or or sewing it back together or something so you know, well there was a snake handler years back and every day he started with like a drop of rattlesnake venom every day you would have just this micro dose and in ancient cultures they would actually take your blood and mix it and prepare it with venom in it for you to re-ingest in a way to um it was the fountain of youth as it were the, you know the drink from the fountain of youth but the venom total pure toxicity um created in, in an immunity Right. So, I mean, the, the adaptation piece is really important, but I think back to the administrative piece, yes, we talk about current events relative to young, but going into the vaccination and the, what is a, you know, what is an inoculation? What is a vaccine? That, that's, that's cool for all the other platforms where if anything goes and we're, we're sticking with the young year, I don't. Yeah. So, um, so Wanda goes on, um, anyway, Jung literally saved my life 
Uh, I had numerous experiences and suffered great anxiety because our culture doesn't support uh, a mythological view, horrible uh, panic attacks. Uh, then I found Jung. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, if, you know, I, I very much sympathize with you, especially as a, as a hyperintuitive, I tend to have synchronistic experiences constantly. I have them every day. And, and uh, some of them are quite powerful. And if you don't know what it is and what's going on, it can really blow your mind. And um, so, yeah, and I mean, personally, I mean, live mythologically, not yeah. philosophically. Right. I mean, and, who are you trying to prove anything to? I mean, that's again, the right. surrogate parent, like, nope, I'd rather have the experience and it have a heart of the matter. Right. And, and when I wrote my novel, which I acknowledge is pornographic in some parts, um, I was, my conscious mind, my personality was shocked by it. And I put it in my drawer for 21 years and uh, didn't know what to do with it. But then when, when the Red Book came out, I said, wow, if this can happen to Carl Jung and that it could happen to me. And so now my novel is published and, uh, and it, I now explain it as it's the autobiography of my anima for a certain period of time uh, when I was living in Japan yeah, because it's, that's the context of it. Um, <laughs> And, um, but if you want to know where it is, you can only find it on, um, what is it? It's on uh, Kindle and it's uh, Mako Memoirs of a Woman. So that's my novel, I, which I wrote originally under a pen name. So it's under my pen name of uh, David Garrett's son. Um, and, uh, yeah, I like, well, I'm just saying, you know, Young saved her life. And I, I, I think that's happened to a lot of people. And what I find is so interesting is, well, Young can save lives because he has the heart of the matter. He has a heart. He has life yeah. in his work, whereas right. Freud is like a fish scale. I mean, he's, he's a, he was a genius and had some great ideas, but, you know, he's so locked in the racist ivory tower of academia and intellectual and I, I won't even say logos because even logos has a magnetic resonance frequency kind of thing, even whether it's alive or not. Um, but Jung has that heart of the matter. And I think that always it's like poetry, except his, you know, ideating paragraphs, three lines or three pages. It's he's speaking in ideas. And I think that appeals to the imagination to strike chords to resonate. And, you know, that rings the doorbell for the unconscious to well up nourishing contents. Whereas other things are explainy or prove-y or too technically, you know, and he's, he's very technical. I mean, you can tell the medical background. You can tell the psychiatry aspect beyond psychology. But there's a, like you said, I think, Brian, you put it best, it's a human quality to it. Mm -hmm. This is just the way his comes across. So that that his life would save lives, I think it's because he poured his life into his work. And so I think we feel that when we're experiencing reading, you know, Jung and discussing Jung, because there's a heart of the matter to talk about, not just look how much I know. I mean, the three of us aren't, you know, oh, look at my CV. Oh, but look at my CV. Oh, look at my resume. You know, it's like, we're not that, we don't kind of care about that. It's, How's the idea working? Right. If he, I, I'm not going to read it, but in the Red Book, there's a wonderful passage about Jung talking about it, academics that is just hilarious. He says, think of all those guys who depend on how, how much their, their books and articles are um, cited and 
you know, whether they've, they've got their, you know, went up on their co colleagues and peers um, this year and that sort of thing. And they're always, you know, trying to brag and that sort of thing. And uh, I love those paragraphs in Jung where you can just see him look up from his glasses and it's like, oh shit, he just locked eyes with some, oh, this is going to be good. Because I mean, when he, when he, unfocused from his work and focused on you know one group or one person it's going to be just as intense but it's like it's going to be hilarity sarcasm and but with the same polysyllabic coding as it would be but uh, he was uh, when he took aim it's like oh boy talk about splitting the arrow <laughs> didn't even aim at himself because he was you know an erudite scholar who produced, you know, tomes of dense writing. <clears throat> so I, I don't think that was lost on him. No, you know, it, that it also all. meant that part of him. Well, I, I think you're right. And I think what's cool about that is I can imagine him going, well, you do know that erudite is quite an erudite word. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> to include the the correct pronunciation which is erudite right right yeah it's not a-i-r-y-o-u-d-i-g-h-t right so susan says well thanks for today's discussion i have lots of words and concepts to go look up and uh yeah i say the same as Linda James, I, um, oh, geez, where was it? Oh, I was watching this movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this movie called The Darkest Hour. It's about Churchill in the month, oh, of, yeah. the month of May. Uh, Susan has just used the V for victory sign like this, right? And um, it's, it's about the month of May 1940 when Britain is just deciding to get into World War II. And uh, they decide to bring on Churchill as the prime minister, although many don't like him. And, um, and so he, the very first thing he does uh, is he gets his picture taken doing the V for victory this way. <laughs> and then uh, one of the other ex characters, uh, his uh, female secretary has to explain to him what it is, what it means. <laughs> I'm not going to say, go see the movie, The Darkest Hour. It's a great movie. Um, yeah. Well, and if you look at him in context, too, his wife was just as much of a firecracker as him. Because, I mean, as they're strolling across the plaza, she sees this street sweeper and she says, hold on one second. Not like this, but you know, hold on one second, uh, honey. I, I, I'm going to go talk to this gentleman. And so she walks over and she's talking to the street sweep for like almost half an hour. And when, you know, she comes back, he said, well, who is that? And <laughs> he says, oh, well, we were madly in love several years before you and I met and we were to be married. He goes, oh, to think. You could have married a street sweeper instead of being married to the prime minister. And she poked him hard in the ribs. She said, Winston, if I would have married him, he would have been prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. You know, so he, no, no way alone his humor you know and his strengths yeah she i just love that story with her she just bam you know and i'm sure he blushed and dressed right down so <laughs> yeah and uh, braxis says young was not afraid of his shadow yes that is absolutely true okay folks i'm gonna call it quits here i'm due for my first haircut since coming back from confluence so uh, I know that my favorite hair cutter is on duty uh, today, nice. so uh, it's time that I take care of that. Uh, so Susan says, thankfully, 
uh, that is my uh, the secrets of the golden flower on this platform. That was a great start for me. Well, I'm glad you all liked it. I there there was a very interesting uh, comment interchange um, on uh, on uh, the secrets of the golden flower uh, this morning. In, in fact, um, and uh, it is. Um, it's a proof of the old philosophical saying, uh, youth will be served often on silver platters. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, there was a, a, a comment that was interesting and I responded to it. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for being yeah. here today. Thanks. We'll we'll start with uh, Jesus next week, um, which, <laughs> which is... What a Chapter chapter 12, oh. how appropriate, chapter 12, uh, page 67 of this version of Answer to Job. Um, That's actually kind of priceless. We'll start with Jesus next week. It's like, oh, wow, we finally, okay, you're on the list. You can come in now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this book is about Answer to Job, and so... Right. Jung had to get through Job before he could bring Christ in at all. Right. Um, well, he's laid the groundwork for Christ himself. You know, I mean, this is all these messy things. I mean, all of this stuff goes into that one, you know, three word Christ as self title. Right. And, and so, uh, uh, and, and part of, yeah. And interestingly, part of the issue of, um, uh, that did come up was that, this person is overseas and he uh, said he couldn't ever get a philosophical discussion going with Asians and he didn't understand why. And I actually explained it in that, that um, story or in that series because, um, you know, Asian language is different. It's visual as opposed to linear and and so they don't think um you know at least people that read japanese chinese um mainly japanese and chinese do not think the way westerners think they do not um they keep the heart of the matter of the imagery the visual fluency of the visual language precisely and precisely and the acumen and, of the heart right and researchers started to get an inkling of that when they were uh, studying a man who had lost the function of his um, right brain uh, and, um, and therefore he, he was Japanese. And of course in Japanese, there are both phonetic and pictorial language. And they realized that he could only read the phonetic language and understand it anymore. He could not read the uh, kanji which is kanji, yeah. which is the actual uh, guts of japanese right the main the main significant part of japanese um and um and so uh that's why it's it's hard to do that in, in east asian cultures in um in Sanskrit and in, in uh, languages that you find in the Middle East that it's a little different because they are phonetic. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, um, well, so go ahead, Brian. I was going to say one, one thing to maybe do if you haven't seen it before is find a movie like an American movie that has either uh, Chinese, particularly it's, it's clearer, uh, Chinese subtitles. Mm -hmm. And you will see 20 characters and they will flash on the screen. It'll be like, bap, bap, bap. Mm -hmm. And they're reading it, but they're, because it's not based in, you know, in sounds, it's based in ideas. Yeah. And there's this immediate apprehension to what it's saying right. without, you know, sub vocalizing or need to read the words. It's see the word precisely. Yeah, the, the visual is like a sound. I mean, it's 
one one image sounds in the mind. I mean, the, like you said, immediate, not sounds in sequence. Boom. The photo, you know, the photographic piece, that whole 20 characters, and they get it like that. Yeah. I mean, right. they're not reading and through. You know, and they're seeing. They take the whole, they, yeah, they clump it, you know, the, the whole thing. Right. Now, um, uh, here's, um, Okay, I, I wanted to mention just on, on that point, Brian, that this is well covered and very interestingly covered in a movie called Drive My Car. Uh, and I urge everyone to see it. It's a Japanese movie, it won Best Foreign Film, but it was also nominated for, for Best Picture this past year. And... Yeah. Um, it really almost it really deserved to be best picture, except for the fact that the movie that won best picture, which was about the deaf mute, is also on the same topic. But it's um, but the interesting aspect of Drive My Car is that um, a, a major portion of it is about um, a producer who is uh, producing a play. And um, this was quite interesting to me because I was working on a play almost in the same way at the same time. But uh, he's producing a play and he's, he brought on as actors um, people that didn't speak Japanese um, and, yeah. and uh, who spoke other languages, including Korean sign language. And, and so the parts in the play, um, it, and I, I think it's, uh, I think the play they're doing is uh, Uncle Vanya by Chekhov. Uh, mm. but, they, but you're wondering, you know, how's this gonna go together? It's very hard to figure out how, how the heck is this gonna go together when all these actors speak these different languages and uh, how, they, how they do it at the end is quite fascinating. I, I'm not going to spoil the thunder of the movie, but uh, it's, uh, it's a big point about how, um, how we can live together. And, and it answers this question about uh, somebody named Marco44 says, boy, I hope the world is gonna be all right in response to the fact that we think differently in different ways. And, uh, and the, ans the answer that comes out of Drive My Car is it will be, don't worry. Um, and and uh, this gets dignity and difference instead of people taking everything personally. Yep. I mean, take it as personally as you want, but not in a reaction as if everything is conflict. It's like, I wasn't talking about you. <laughs> I was confessing something about myself. And then now you're all spinning off going, it's like, you know, it, it's interesting to me that you, you say just the right, wrong word at the right, wrong time. And people have redefined it based on the sound bites. And it had nothing to do with what you were talking about with the actual, you actually well, open and, addiction. And, and that word means this. And we have to remember the, the essence of the message from my coffee cup, which is if a man speaks in the, in the desert and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? <laughs> in, in, uh, you know, somehow the world has survived over uh, multiple millennia uh, with men and women. And being lives. wrong. With, with the fact that, um, is he still wrong? And the answer is, yeah, emphatically, yes. And, and boy, do I ever see it in my own marriage where every time I open my mouth, I'm wrong. <laughs> why, why, why are you parking there? Why are you, why, why are you parking there? I mean, it's, it's, no, I, it's I, funny, I'll go, with, I'll go with my mountain time, you know, it's, the, what does it say? Perico, Perico, Chapo, Chihuahua, and Geronimo, Homeland Security. Right. <laughs> 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 Fighting terrorism since 1492. Yeah. 
great. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, maintaining the multi perspectives and curiosity. Yeah, you have to yeah, the curious. curiosity and the wonderment. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh wow, you're different. Cool. Tell me about that. Not, ooh, different. You know, yeah. I mean. Right, and uh, Braxis says we can only have full control of what is within, not what is without. Absolutely, thank you, Braxis, for that. And also, he mentions Catch Twenty Two. <laughs> yeah, there's always a catch, right? <laughs> and it's always Catch Twenty Two. Uh, well, it, interesting too to me. I mean, people who the um, oh that 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 work is that's divination. That work is of the devil, and I'm like, you know. So in your Christianity, why are you hanging garlic to ward off the vampires at your door? Um, hmm. <laughs> okay. Like, the so so uh, Justin makes an interesting question. A woman, he says, woman, quote, unquote, is also difficult to define. What do people nowadays actually mean when they express their wish to change sex into a man or a woman. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think we better leave that to the psychiatrists and psychotherapists, but um, I don't <clears throat> think your, your sexual equipment is very relevant and therefore I wouldn't be surgically changing it regardless of how you define yourself. <laughs> well, I, don't know, I think it depends, but I think <clears throat> that like we just said a god cannot contain the multitudes right it spins off <clears throat> a satan it spins off a jesus spins off a mother of god yeah and angel i i think gender is the same way you got two genders so now you're, you're it's just a uh instead of mono, it spins monolith. Off a bunch of, uh, yeah, it's, ones, yeah. I, I can't contain what is true right? it's the same with anima and animas the, the right right it is, it is not enough, the classical Jungian thought of anima and animals. Absolutely. It's, well, and it's, it's interesting just how you just said that even. It calls to mind that, you know, when someone is really surprised and just really, wow, that's out there, they'll go, oh, holy mother of God. Well, the figure of speech is even the surprise of that way beyond this. It comes off, spins off the mother of God. I mean, so even in the figures of speech we use, you know. I, well, what I what I would say in response to your point, Brian, though, is that um, the Myers Briggs sort of sums it up here in the sense that there are four scales. They're not they're not either or. They're four scales okay. along a continuum, and so in the Myers Briggs, you know if you use the four letter description of a personality type, you only get 16, but in point of fact, there's an, there's a infinite number because you can slice and die each dice, each one of those scales, um, you know, infinitely small and have different well, and even, personalities. Yeah. That's a great point. And also to get that off of a linear and into an image three dimensional, if you take the 16 squares and they each have a, a pillar, mm -hmm. and a graph that goes up and down, oh, 20% on this one, zero there, all the way up to the top. I mean, what's mm -hmm. what's your, you know, three-dimensional Rubik's cube, you know, your little cubert or the, you know, how are these, I guess an equalizer on a stereo stereo would be a way to visualize you know how are these bars moving up and down in these 16 spots and what percentage is what and where are you equally loaded and balanced or are you more here i mean and like you say you know the it's infinite fine, the infinite distinctions of at any height of any of the pieces changes to a whole different personality right in these temperament states i am pretty convinced for the same person over time are dynamic yes so not in terms of like development but i'm saying depending on what's going on yeah absolutely, what absolutely. present itself and so i think it's you know just what you said but i think it's doing this or well it's this yeah. over a lifetime um, as a mathematician would say it's a calculus problem mm -hmm. yeah and that, drop that last term and you're good 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Say, yeah, exactly. Without it's a, and, it's a calculus, and, uh, there are no problems. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's uh, exactly. a very simple uh, definition of calculus is a curved line in hypo, hyperspace. Right. Yeah. A curved line in multidimensional space, but the dimensions mm. themselves are infinite. And so, right. um, so this is why mm. AI will never take over human beings because AI can only work um, rationally. Yeah, they would take over, they'll just eliminate us first. It's, they might eliminate it's us. Like calculus. I, I, you know, exactly. <laughs> kaboom. Yeah. Kaboom. Hey, what are all those? Like, what's all that diffy Q stuff? Oh, don't worry. It's just like A through Z. They're just did not yeah. 26. Well, it's there like... was an interesting report uh, last night that said that that AIs um, become uh, racist and sexist. Are, uh, if left to their own devices, they become racist and sexist. Um, Wouldn't that be the machine learning from the news that's available? I mean, it's, that what are they learning? I mean... Well, and they're learning for, from uh, from people that were brought up in a patriarchal, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a patriarchal sort of um, mono-racist culture up till now. And, well, you know, and it's interesting. Who's I mean, writing your code? Yeah, who's writing your code? Right? Exactly. Who's writing your code? Yeah, the Gigo. I mean, I remember in college that and the philosophy graduate philosophy course, Image and Reality of Man and the Machine in Modern Literature. And we were talking about Turin's machine model and we ventured off into what is consciousness, what is sentience, what is cognizance, what's AI. And the professor just pushed this cartoon out onto the table and you know, as it moved around, everyone was just cackling. And what it was, was these two AI doctors, philosophers, whatever they were at this table, looking down, okay, we have all that done. How will we know when it's truly conscious? And right behind him, the copier leans back on its back two casters and says, oh, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, you know, yeah, right it's, behind him. Yeah. So it's, okay, it's so, the, the it's not like poetry, you know, comedy yeah. and humor, religion, art, music. I yes. don't think that's coming out of code. Yeah, transcendence does not come out of code, you know, and I mean, it's each of those has a transcendent quality. That, right. You know, and Braxis says, without the patriarch, there is no matriarch, and vice versa. And also, without the patriarch, there's no future. So, oh, without the matriarch, there's nothing to fill the future. Right. That's right. It's, so, anyway. Okay. Yes, everybody. both, 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 and always. okay. Yeah. Right. Ga games with language. I'll, right, see, thanks, I'll see you next week, or right. or maybe tomorrow. Oh no! By the way, I may not be here next week. Um, mm -hmm. I am called to deliver another um, water bearer statue, oh, okay. and I want to. Um, I want people to just know that in our um, in our confluence, we um, developed for the confluence um, a a uh, an award, let's say, um, and that award is the water bearer, which is the symbol of the Aquarian age. Here, here I am looking at it. This is the water bearer. And uh, so far we have um, awarded uh, four of these water bearers. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that next Saturday or Sunday we will be awarding the fifth. Um, and, um, but the water bearer is symbolic of the confluence between Jungian thought and astrology. And, um, and let's see. Um, that's a powerful mix. 
That's Liz Green in this book, Young's, Young's Studies in Astrology, on page 157, says exp explicitly this. Um, there's been considerable speculation as to where Jung acquired the idea of a new age in relation to the movement of the ver vernal equinoctial point. This seems to be particularly important because Jung has been credited with being the first person in modern times to disseminate the idea that the long anticipated new age would be Aquarian. And, um, and so Liz Green is a very widely renowned astrologer and also a Jungian analyst um, made that point in her book that Jung was the first to note that, that uh, astrology and Jungian psychology um, match up in the human being, Carl Jung. And so, you know, and what's so powerful about the Aquarian piece astrologically is it's a double sign in that the water bearer, Aquarius is a big, big air sign. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is you have the breath of life or breath of God and the water of life and the water of God. So you, you get both at the same time. So all the rest, and then the water bearer implies the vessel. So there's the whole recipe for life is in Aquarius in that way. The story is told completely, whereas in other signs, it's a piece or a part. Um, right. And so in, in this image, the, the female uh, figure is Sophia, and she's pouring wisdom down to humanity. Right. Uh, who's, uh, as, <laughs> as is discussed, we're, we're still in our teenage years, so we're passing uh, wisdom down. But the new age will be a, an age of wisdom. Um, and, and so this piece is going to be made into a, a larger sculpture that will be eight feet tall uh, by eight by five. So I guess the width is five, but the height and length is eight feet. And uh, so it will become a pilgrimage site uh, in Helena, Montana, not only for Jungians, but also for astrologers. And uh, we believe the, the piece itself will become an award both for Jungians and for astrologers in their, in their groups. And then to the extent there are groups of astrologers who meet and want to recognize, recognize one another's uh, efforts in the previous year, it'll become like an Academy Award. And, and for you. The thing that's so powerful about that sculpture too, is that, you know, the, the whole recipe for life there, but then there's the sharing of life from the one to the other. So, you know, that that's the, the dance, you know, the community of uh, the DNA of the community is the two, not the one. So back to, you know, Brian, you, you know, everything, Opening it up, right. And so, um, uh, I'll. Uh, I guess I'm going to publish our award ceremony. I, I still need to do that. I had done it once on the first version uh, that I published of um, of the rabbi and the, the analyst and the rabbi, uh, because we did the war award ceremony at the end of the play. And so some people may have seen it, but uh, it is now removed because I now have published the professional version of the play on the YouTube channel. So um, maybe today at some point I will publish the award ceremony uh, so people hear what is said about, about the, the uh, four uh, awardees. There are actually five people, but one one statuette was uh, awarded jointly. Um, and so number five will, is going to go out um, 
hopefully next weekend. But, you know, so I'll, I'll hopefully let everybody know. It depends on whether I have a sculpture in hand or not by Friday. If I have it in hand, then I'll probably have to go deliver it with uh, our, our friend Bob Manis. But if I do not, then I'll be here. <laughs> okay. Are, are you <clears throat> aware of the Salome Institute? No. So that is a collaboration between the union psychologist, her name is Satya Doyle Bayok, B-Y-O-C-K, and an astrologer, Carol Ferris. I put a link in the chat. Huh. Um, they did a very interesting, uh, I think it was a 28 uh, segment uh, podcast series on the Red Book uh, with you know, them, you know, even speaking about, you know, he gives dates and talking about the chart of the dates uh, and, you know, Jung's natal chart in relation, but also, you know, that's whatever symbols came up astrologically in the, in the red book, among other things. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, it's, you know, a podcast available uh, near you. Well, yeah, they're still in existence. That goes right with Ion. You know, and he goes through the the wobble, twenty four thousand, twenty five thousand years, mm -hmm. two thousand five hundred or whatever years at a time, and he he cycles through that whole and an epochal, you know, an epic, you know, e p o c h um, level, not just day to day. So yeah, that I'm gonna have to look them up. I didn't know about that. That's that sounds wonderful. Yeah, I thought it was a great series on the Red Book. Yeah, as it and S A L O M. Yeah, in the graph. yeah, as in Salome in the Red Book. Yeah, okay. Right, and uh, Liz Green, by the way, mentions in her book about Jungian studies and astrology that many Jungians have tried to write astrology out of the Jungian world, unsuccessfully, of course. Um, but um, it, she points out that uh, astrology is not mentioned the word astrology is not mentioned a single time in memory streams reflections and, well, and there's also astropsychology yeah astropsychology and, and who's that by this is this is by glenn perry uh -huh. and he makes the distinction between astropsychology and psychological astrology and it's interesting um that I won't go into the whole piece of it, but it, it's a wonderfully put together book. I've just gotten into it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the same kind of thing with Liz Green. I mean, you get this a power of how it's not just astrology anymore. This becomes the, you know, people in a room astrology, the personalities of the planets, personalities of the asteroids. So there's a certain, there's a real mythological piece that she brought back in that other people have been picking up on yeah well people don't understand mythology and and uh they don't understand astrology and yeah. how how it works <clears throat> and well, how it yeah, has and worked what's interesting is it's and it's strange to me that that's what's least understood is because that's living story whereas philosophy is dead story mm -hmm. crystallized yeah, yeah, never had a live story. If P, then Q, or if P, if and only if A, then Q. I mean, that's not alive. It never was. It's just, yeah, it that's, never was. Philosophy uh, is all rationality. Yeah, that's juggling and smoke and mirrors. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. that's philosophers. This, way, this is too easy to go on for a long time. Yeah, we. You, you have haircuts. Yeah, uh, haircut. Yeah, haircut. Yeah.